Okay, we're, we're spending our summer uh, discovering what it means to abide in Jesus and, and how do we stay synced to him and, and who we can be, who he designed us to be. And I, and I know that this is a huge challenge, but uh, as we, this morning, we, we're going to consider the rhythm of life. And as we consider that uh, and how we can live in such a way as to stay synced to God, the first thing that we discover is that God has rhythm. And, I mean, who would have thought? Who would have thought that, that God can dance, you know, to put it that way? And I, I dare say even that, and I'm, I know I'm kind of going out here, This I don't have scripture to back this up, but I, I'm sure that Jesus had rhythm because it says that Jesus did all things well. So, I mean, he, he definitely has rhythm. And you may not think that's important that that. God has rhythm, but it really is, because the, the rhythm of God is reflected in all of creation and everything that he's made. So, so we start just with one example, one that's familiar to you. It's in the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1, 1 through 4. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was, was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. So the, the first picture that we see in creation is chaos. There's darkness. There's void. The Spirit of God is kind of brooding over the chaos. And, and we know that, that something big is just about to happen. Because he's not going to leave this chaos. He's not going to leave this void. So he says, let there be light. And there's light. And God confirmed that the light was good. And then he separated it from darkness. So from chaos, God creates order. And then we go through the days of creation and if you notice there, on each day, there is an increase of order and there's a rhythm to each day. On the fourth day, God creates the sun, the moon, the stars, and he says, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for the signs for seasons and for days and years. That's in Genesis 1.14. And that phrase signs and seasons that's the first time that that appears but it's a very important concept because the seasons of the year the the rhythm of the year they serve as a sign of God's control and God's power over creation so so God causes the tree to yield its fruit in due season as it says in Psalm 1:3 God gives the rain in the season, Deuteronomy 28, 12. And the fact that God has established order and the rhythm of nature in the seasons is confirmation that God is the supplier of everything that is needed. And it will come because the seasons change. And in fact, we, we see there's this order and there's this rhythm of God. He says that even the animals know the seasons and the rhythm of life. So, so God established an order to the year for the people who were in covenant with me and they had with, with him and they had these, these national days of celebration and festivals and each one, each one of these festivals had the purpose of establishing a, a rhythm to, to the month and to the year, to, to work and to celebration and, and worship and even repent, repentance. So we have the day of Pentecost, which happens to be uh, today in the life of the church. Um, it, before it was the day of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the believers there in Jerusalem, they were there for the Jewish festival of Pentecost, which was like their harvest festival. It was like Thanksgiving to them. And they would leave their work and leave their home places and gather up their families and make this journey to Jerusalem to celebrate that God does give 
produce. God causes the grain to grow and gives the rain. He supplied the nutrition that they needed. And it's, it's an annual observance. And they had all these other days. I mean, festivals gave them rhythm and life. Uh, they had Passover, which most of us are familiar with. That's kind of like, really, our Fourth of July festival, where we celebrate the formation of our nation. Passover was the celebration of the formation of their nation by deliverance from Egypt by God. And work ceased, and they, they packed up their little ones, and, and, and they went to Jerusalem, and there they celebrated that fact. They also had a national day of repentance, uh, Day of Atonement, or you might see it on a calendar as Yom Kippur as it's celebrated today but, or observed today. But on that day, the high priest once a year would lay his hand on the bull and transfer the sin of the nation on this bull, and then the bull would be slaughtered, and his blood would be an atonement for all of the people. And, and the other act that they did was the, in the same manner, the, the high priest would lay his hand on the goat and the goat would receive the sin of the people of Israel, and then the goat would be led out into the wilderness, never to be found again. The sin would be carried away, and that's where we get the term scapegoat. But there's other festivals. As a matter of fact, every month has a festival, and, and they gave life order. There was rhythm because God has rhythm, because creation has rhythm, and he wants his people to stay in sync to him, to, to kind of dance to his tune that he's built into all everything that he's made to observe his seasons. He also established a rhythm to the weak. Did you know that Israel is the first society to have a seven-day week? And that was because of the seven days of creation. So they lived their lives in accordance with what God had done. And we find that when God was done with creation, it says that he rested on the seventh day. Genesis 2, 1 through 3. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Now that, that phrase... God rested on the seventh day and made it holy means that God set it aside. It's holy. It's a special day. It's consecrated to him. It's not like the other six days. It's different. And even God rested. And of course he rested because, you see, he had worked six days. Do you, do you see the, the example there for us? Because God has rhythm. And since he had set that day apart, he established it to be a special day. Everybody that was in covenant with him would rest like he rested. They would be in sync with him. They would rest with him. They would work six days, and then they would rest on, this, on the day of rest, on the Sabbath. And that would be a sign for them that they were with God, in sync with God, in rhythm with God. They were abiding with him. They were remaining with him because they rested with him. So we have the rhythm of the seasons, and we have this annual rhythm, and we also we have this weekly rhythm, and there's also a daily rhythm. Their day began at sunset. Because the Hebrew people, you see, following God's lead, started their day at sunset. Back, back there on the first day of creation, when the day was over, it says in Genesis 1-5, it says, and there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. See, it doesn't say there was morning and evening like we would say. It says there's evening and morning the first day. So this daily rhythm began with rest. But there's order and there's rhythm to every day. There are three times a day that each Hebrew person uh, went into prayer, morning, noon, and evening. And this is reflected in many places in Scripture. Uh, one is Psalm 55, 17. Uh, the writer says, evening and morning and at noon I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. Also the example of Daniel, when he was in captivity in Babylon, he kneels and he faces Jerusalem three times a day in prayer. And that's the rhythm of every day, still practiced by Hasidic Jews today. 
uh, years ago when I was on El Al flight to, to head to Tel Aviv to, to, to visit Israel, uh, in, in the middle of the flight, uh, all the Hasidic Jews, they get up and they put their prayer claws on and they go to the back of the plane and they're back there as you see them bobbing their head in rhythm to have their noon prayers together. Now there's other rhythms uh, daily in the Hebrew family. Morning and evening meals were times to teach the children. God had told them, remember, uh, to, to speak of him, to teach of these things when you're when you walk and when you lie down, when, when you're, you rise up, that's the rhythm to their day. Now, we may not have that three times regiment rhythm of a prayer for the day, but God has built into every human being a, a rhythm, uh, the circadian rhythm. Some of you may be familiar with that. This is, this is scientific. This is not like the biorhythm thing that you know, is, is, is completely unproven. But, but we are designed by God in a way that we have a, a time when, when all human beings, our, our body functions differently throughout the day. So um, I, I came up with this diagram. I'm not going to read everything that's on here. Uh, some of these, you know, you can, you can just, just Google it when you get home, okay? But, but it says like at, at 10 o'clock in, in the morning that we have a, a moment of high alertness. So, so if you're really sharp at 10 o'clock in the morning, you know why that is. And then it says at 2.30 in the afternoon, according to the circadian rhythm, that's our time of best coordination. So, and, and also at 3.30, it's our fastest reaction time. So if you're competing in sports, you want to do that, you know, 2.30 to 3.30 because that's going to be your best time. 6.30 at night is, is the highest blood pressure. And then you know, 7 o'clock is the highest body temperature. So if uh, your wife gets up and starts adjusting the thermostat in the house at 7 o'clock, now you know what's going on, all right? And then at, at 9 o'clock, it says that melatonin secretion starts. So you're sitting there watching the tube or reading or whatever you're doing about 9 o'clock, you start fighting it. That's what's going on. But we were created with this diff different rhythm for each day physically and uh, with our hormones uh, as human beings. So we have seasons, we have months, we have weeks, we have days. And God designed the universe and ordered the lives of his people to be in sync, to be in rhythm with each other and to be in rhythm with him. And it's all that's said about this, probably the best known is comes from uh, king Solomon, who um, you know is the the third king and the son of David, and in Ecclesiastes three one through four, these are are words that most of you have heard. Some of you old boomers uh, have heard these words. Uh, the birds had a hit song way back in the '60s. Turn, 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 and 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 it comes from this. It says, "For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant." a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance. And he goes on there. He finally finishes, you know, his point is, is that there's rhythm. And, and in verse 11, he says, He, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. Everything that we have in life is beautiful, admirable, in the right rhythm and time. So as we say, it's all about timing. Now, th now there's a lot more that we could look at considering the rhythm of creation, and, and we could look at, at the migration of animals, of, of how that's built into them. Or, or I, I think of the universe itself and our solar system and how our planets rotate and revolve and how that solar system moves within our galaxy and how our Milky Way galaxy moves with other galaxies within the universe and everything is moving in sync and in rhythm and the slightest deviation of that and everything falls apart. All of creation, you see, is in sync as opposed to chaos. Now, the question 
for us this morning is, are we in rhythm? Are we in sync? And to kind of give us a handle on this, help us look at this, I I want to use a few tools developed by Mike Breen, who's uh, the the founder of 3DM Ministries, and we've been walking with them for a couple years now, learning from them how to discover how what, what God has designed us to to handle stress and how to be productive. And we are created, of course, to be productive and to work. In fact, work is never seen as a bad thing in the Bible. Only laziness is seen as a bad thing in the Bible. But work that's not in balance uh, causes stress cracks as we start to get out of rhythm with how God has made us to be. And remember that God created rest and his rhythm to life moves from rest to work. The day starts with rest in his system. We do it backwards most of the time. Most of the time we rest after working so hard. But God designs us to rest first and then work out of the abundance of recreation and energy that we found in that rest. So as we we look, first of all, at this semicircle, and this is just a little figure to help us understand this, we see rest on the left side, we see work on the right, and there's a pendulum in the middle that swings back and forth in rhythm, just like the pendulum on a clock between rest and work. God created work, remember, and he created rest, and we are made in God's image, and we are called to model in our lives to carry him, to to carry his image in this world, and that means also to carry his rhythm in this world. And remember that rest was one of the Ten Commandments. It was one of the big ones. It's up there with things like lying and stealing and murder, and God says rest. You know, it's a commandment. Without rest, there's chaos and there's disorder and we have no rhythm. Now, I, I really identify with this concept of, of moving into chaos when we become too distracted or, or too arrogant and we think that my work, I can do anything with my work. Uh, if we would just pay attention a little bit to our, our creative moments um, and at times when we get clarity and insight, I am confident that we would find that most of our creative moments, most of our real insight moments come after we have rested. As we get later in the week, as a matter of fact, if you're working a, a 40 hour or longer nine to five kind of work week, uh, you, you get past hump day and things just kind of fall apart, right? There's this hectic schedule of trying to get everything done by week's end, but creativity really wanes there. Have you ever um, considered that at creation, the, the first experience that humans had with God was rest? says that he, he created them on the sixth day. And then God l- looked at the human being and said, this is very, very good. And then he rested. So the first experience that they have with God isn't with work, but it's with rest. So we have to begin, you see, with this place of rest. Resting in God, abiding in his presence, physically resting, psychologically rest- resting in him. It's the only way that we can really be successful. And yet, how many of us schedule our rest? Most of us schedule our work, but we don't schedule our rest. This is different, isn't it? It, I mean, if we want to to build our church, if we want to build our family, if we want to build our vocation, we, we must get in sync with God. And that means, first of all, that we learn and we intentionally rest in him. We need moments every day when we rest in him. We need moments a day every week when we rest in him. And we need seasons, longer moments or or days and weeks where we rest in him. And there's no substitute. So then when the pendulum swings from rest to work, we're ready. Now, Last week, we went through John 15, 1 to 8, and, and that was the passage, uh, if you weren't here, when Jesus used the illustration of a grapevine and how he is the vine and we are the branches. And if we abide in him, if we remain in him, the vine, 
then we, the branches, grow and we produce fruit. And I think we very much like that. We like the idea of being fruity and productive very much. But, but then it says that Jesus says that after we produce fruit, that God, the vine dresser, prunes us back so that we might bear more fruit. The pendulum swings, you see, back and forth. We abide in him, we grow, we bear fruit, we're pruned, then we enter into a time, the pendulum swings back to rest and abiding again. And this rhythm of life really is about timing, isn't it? Because if we abide too long and do not grow and produce, if we just become lazy, then we produce nothing. And it says that if we produce nothing, that the vine dresser cuts the branch off the vine and throws it away. And if we just work, if we just you know, make that pendulum stay over there and we do not uh, allow ourselves to be pruned and we do not go back to abiding, then we dry up, we have no nutrition. Now, the word growth is not mentioned, I know, in John 15. Um, growth seems to be a result of the rhythm of being established. Growth is not the same thing as producing fruit. We have to grow before we see fruit. Fruit doesn't just pop out of a vine on day one or two, but it takes uh, for grapes at least three years. If you're planting a fruit tree, it takes many years for fruit to appear on it. And in our instant society, I think we need to remember that, that, that we grow as we abide. And some of us may be young in this, and, and we need to grow for a while and to be patient with ourselves and patient with God before we start to see the fruit. Now, I want to talk just a few minutes about pruning. Yeah, I think it's crucial to learn when we're being pruned, to, to learn when this pruning time is. Those of you that have done garden work know how, how vital it is to, to some plants like rose bushes to prune them off, or if, if you're growing anything that produces fruit, it has to be pruned off. Now we have those knockout roses where you can just, you don't need to know anything. You just go out there as a, with, with loppers and just chop them off and they come back and it's just fantastic. It makes everybody look good. But the roots continue to grow, you see, and the nutrition base gets larger and larger and you prune it off and it grows back better and stronger. And in the same way, our lives, after time of intense work and, and high production, we oftentimes are pruned back so we can have this season of abiding and resting and then we grow again. And knowing and accepting the fact, surrendering to the fact that we are being pruned means that we do not push against the pendulum to keep us in a production mode when there's no nutrition there to sustain the production or the growth. So there needs to be an abiding time daily and weekly and in season. And God prunes us back for that. Now just kind of thinking of some examples of that, we see this in business oftentimes if you've worked in business, that when there's a lull in the season, that the, the motivation in the business, usually from the top down, is work harder, struggle more, production is waning, you have to get out there and sell, sell, sell. When actually what is happening is there is a time of pruning and a season of rest. And, and maybe this is the time, or definitely this is the time, when instead of trying to produce something on our own sheer will, our own efforts that we learn how to rest and how to be restored during that time because the season's going to come when, when that pendulum swings back. And if we have not gotten the nutrition that we needed in that abiding time, we will not have the potential or the ability to grow and to produce again. But we all have seasons of pruning. Sometimes it's, it's in work. Sometimes it's in relationships. We have things that are taken away from us. And life slows down and producing stops. You know, here at the gathering uh, a couple months ago, um, it was Lent time and I was 
you know, looking at, or, or it was right after Lent, and I was looking at a bulletin one Sunday, and I turned it over, and there was not one thing on the back of the bulletin. Nothing new happening at all. There, there were no, no meetings. There, there were no, no teachings. Nothing was there. And at first it kind of startled me like, oh my, you, you've let this thing drop. And then I realized, no, we've just gone through an intense period where there's a lot going on. And we're in a season now of being pruned back. And we need to just abide and to catch our breath and to, to rest in God. And he will give us the growth and the production later. But, but we need to, to accept the pruning shears when they come our way as being from God. Now, how are we going to learn the rhythm? I mean, some of you are going to say, well, that's just really easy for you to say, Don. Rest, rest, rest. You don't have uh, two, three kids, four kids at home, you know, um, you, and, and that's true. It's just a lot easier for me to say, well, I think I'm going to take the day off. Um, you know, I don't punch a time clock. And I think this evening I'll just sit with a book on the porch and just abide. You know, it's just a lot easier for me. But, but let me just give you a few hints because I've been in this season that you're in and I could have done it so much better. And, you know, just like the Bible, we, we get our best teaching sometimes from the negative illustrations. So the first thing I want to tell you is to learn the rhythm, accept the rhythm, accept the God-created rhythm. Uh, you may not like it. You may think that you can, uh, you know, go against this, but you won't. Uh, you will not be productive. So just accept this, what, what, the way that you are made and the way that you are designed to abide in him. And the second thing that I want to say is, is to be intentional about this. Don't, don't just let the clock push you around, but be, in a, be intentional about your abiding and about your rhythm. Declare some sacred time. And, and I know the faster that life is for you, and probably, you know, if you're in your mid-30s, that, that it's going extremely fast right now. And you're going to have to be intentional to carve out some time out of each day and each week. Most of us are driving every day sometime. Uh, that's just one example of time that you can claim for yourself. You got a 20-minute commute, that 20 minutes, turn the radio off. Claim that 20 minutes is yourself. It's just you and God, you know. Uh, d don't look at the phone. Don't, don't, don't pay any attention to that. But just, just claim that time. Or maybe 20 or 30 minutes after dinner in the evening. Maybe that's a routine that you might be able to move into, is to say our family is going to have a routine where we're actually going to eat together. We're going to sit down at the table and have a meal together. And there's not going to be any phones. and There's not going to be any TV on. And then when that's over with, either myself personally or my wife and I, or husband and I, uh, are going to take some abiding time by ourselves. We're just going to make that sacred time, intentional time. And then the last thing that I would say there, just, just to some ideas, just throwing out, you could be much more creative than I'm being with this. But let's take Sunday back. I mean, let's recapture a Sabbath day, even if it's not Sunday. Take Saturday or some other day of the week and say, this is my day of arrest. God has given this to me, and I am not stronger than God. If God rested on the seventh day, then I can rest and abide on the seventh day and have fun with it. Many of us that grew up in the church, Sundays were a law time. It was what can I get away with? How little you know, who's going to catch me mowing my yard and stuff like that? That's not the intention of, of the Sabbath at all. God gives us the Sabbath. Jesus says, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. So enjoy it. Have fun in it. Rest in it. Be restored. Just abide in him. Just attach to that, that vine, his branches, and just get the nutrition. Come to 
the fountain Dip your heart in the streams of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out